Good afternoon to those that logged in and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Chris Stamel and I am the Southwest South Central AFI inspector for the AFI program. Just some housekeeping rules during the presentation portions of the webinar, um, all participants microphones will be muted. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Submitted questions and comments will be monitored by a staff member with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. At any time during the webinar, when asking a question, please, please include your name, city and facility, business or nonprofit organization if applicable. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online for all participants. It is with great pleasure we welcome Dr. Cara Williams. Dr. Williams earned her doctorate of veterinary medicine and a certifi certificate of global health in 2013 from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Williams or practiced livestock, exotic, companion animal medicine prior to joining USDA Food Safety and Inspection Services in 2017 as a supervisory public health veterinarian. She worked closely with the industry to ensure regulatory compliance in disease prevention and animal welfare as livestock entered the, su the food supply chain. Dr. Williams joined the CDC as a veterinary medical officer in July 2020 with a focus on regulatory compliance and the importation of animals that pose a public health risk. Dr. Williams' professional interest includes zoonotic disease, foreign animal disease, and disparities in health outcomes for humans and their animal attributes. Welcome, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Chris Demo. Let me share my screen here. All right. I really want to thank the Kansas Department of Agriculture for inviting CDC here to speak with you all today. I'm really happy to be here. I think this will be a great opportunity to go over some really important questions. Um, regarding bringing new animals from foreign countries into your facilities. I'm Dr. Kara Williams. I'm a veterinary medical officer with CDC in the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. I'm in the Quarantine and Border Health Services branch of CDC. Today, we'll be reviewing CDC entry requirements for importing dogs and cats. We'll discuss some common reasons that dogs are denied entry into the United States. Um, dogs and cats both are denied entry. We'll briefly go over a few diseases of concern when, when importing animals from foreign countries. And we'll discuss some tips for keeping your staff and your facilities safe when importing, bringing in new animals from foreign countries. The importation of animals is governed by multiple agencies, as you can see on this slide. The United States Department of Agriculture the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, here at the bottom right, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. We all work together at the ports of entry to ensure safe, the safe importation of animals. And we have slightly different focus, focuses in um, the regulations and our enforcement of the regulations but we all have to work together to make sure the animals coming in are safe, both for people and animals in this country. And so you'll see here the USDA, they really focus more on animal welfare and on livestock and equine health, <coughs> excuse me. Whereas CDC, we focus more on zoonotic diseases of public health concern. So diseases that animals can spread to people. Today, I'll be going over CDC requirements but be sure to verify with the other agencies what additional requirements they may have before you bring in animals from foreign countries. Of particular note, the USDA requires a permit to import animals for the purposes of rescue 
adoption or resale, which may apply to many of your organizations. And the requirements for that USDA permit are more extensive than the CDC requirements that I'll be presenting today. So as far as CDC is concerned, our focus is, our major focus is um, for both dogs and cats is to prevent the importation and the reintroduction of the canine rabies virus variant, also called dog rabies. The regulation requires that dogs and cats must be healthy upon arrival. There are many variants of the rabies virus named for the predominant host species. And while the US still has several variants such as bat rabies and raccoon rabies, the dog variant of the rabies virus was eliminated from the US in 2007. However, dog rabies still exists in many countries and the variant, and it is the variant responsible for the vast majority of human deaths caused by rabies. So most of the time when people get rabies, they get it from a dog. Dogs from countries that have a high risk of rabies, therefore must have a valid rabies vaccination certificate upon arrival at the port of entry per CDC regulation. Additionally, there were three cases of importations of rabid dogs from Egypt back in 2015, in 2017, and in 2019. These importations resulted in a suspension of dog importations from Egypt, which is still in effect today. Uh, this suspension was put into place in 2019. Dogs cannot be imported from Egypt unless they are issued a CDC per permit in advance of importation. These permits are rarely issued, but if you're interested in importing a dog from Egypt, or if you have any questions about the suspension of dog importations from Egypt, please contact us at the email on the slide, cdcanimalimports at cdc.gov, if you have any questions regarding the permit, uh, the Egypt suspension, as well as any of the other regulations pertaining to dogs and cats. For visual learners, CDC entry requirements for dogs and cats imported into the United States are shown in this table here. Dogs and cats are both required to be healthy on arrival. They are subject to examination at the port of entry to rule out zoonotic diseases, which again, those are diseases that animals can spread to people. Pets may require veterinary medical examination, treatment, or isolation if they appear seriously Ill, Ill. And they may require a necropsy, which is an animal autopsy, and possibly rabies testing if they arrive dead. The care, treatment, and testing of pets that arrive ill, injured, or dead will be required by CDC at the expense of the importer. For dogs, CDC requires dogs to be accompanied by proof of rabies vaccination upon entering the US unless they have proof that the dogs have not been in a country that is at high risk for dog rabies for at least the past six months. If a dog has visited or is arriving from a high risk country and proof of rabies vaccination is not met, the dog will be denied entry and returned to the country of departure at the expense of the importer. Additionally, importation of dogs specifically from Egypt, like I already said, has been suspended. So all dogs from Egypt will be denied entry unless the dog is accompanied by a CDC dog import permit. These entry requirements apply to all dogs, regardless of the purpose of importation. For example, dogs intended to to be pets or dogs coming in for commercial resale or for service animals. And the requirements apply to all of these dogs and may be found on the website on this slide. For cats, as you can see here, CDC does not require a rabies vaccination certificate or health certificate or any other documentation. However, cats must appear healthy on arrival. The countries highlighted in blue here on the map are considered by CDC to be high risk for dog rabies. 
dogs imported from these countries are required to have a valid rabies vaccination certificate. If you go to the link on this slide here, that has an extent, the, the full list of every single country or political unit that is um, required, that is considered high risk. And the dogs from those countries must have a valid rabies vaccination certificate when they're imported into the US. So I'm, I must emphasize again that the rabies vaccination certificates are really only required for the dogs coming in from those high-risk countries that were just on the list previously. So the rabies vaccination requirements for dogs from those countries specify that puppies must be at least 12 weeks old before they receive their first rabies vaccination. This is due to the way to the puppy's immune system. Before 12 weeks of age, the puppy still has maternal antibodies um, from the mother that would interfere with the efficacy of the vaccine. So if the dog is vaccinated before 12 weeks of age, CDC will consider that vaccine to be invalid and the dog will be denied entry. Additionally, dogs must be vaccinated against rabies for the first time at least 28 days before entry into the United States because that's how long it takes for the dogs to get maximum protection from the vaccination to be fully immunized against rabies. This means that dogs must be at least 16 weeks old when it enters the United States to be able to meet these rabies vaccination certificate requirements. Please note that CDC veterinarians provide age estimates of young puppies at the ports of entry by examining their teeth. For example, um, using a picture like the one you see here on this slide that's, that shows a puppy with the deciduous or baby teeth just barely starting to come in. So this puppy would be estimated to be about six to eight weeks of age. And if it's coming from a high risk country, that's too young for them to have a valid rabies vaccination certificate and they would be denied entry into the US. So then when we go and review the paperwork, we're checking to make sure the rabies vaccination certificate meets CDC's requirements for having all of the required information. The rabies vaccination certificate must include four categories of information. It must have the owner information, the dog's information, the vaccine information, and the veterinarian information. Specifically, it must include the name and the address of the, of the owner, the breed, sex, date of birth, or approximate age of date of birth is not known, color, markings, and any other identifying information for the dog. The date of rabies vaccination must be included as well as the vaccine product information, such as the name of the manufacturer and the lot number. Additionally, the date the vaccination expires should be included. So if it's a three-year rabies vaccine, that must be listed that the, va the vaccine is, is valid um, for three years or the date that the vaccination, the next vaccination is due. And then lastly, the veterinarian's name, license number, address, and signature is required, but this is specifically required of the veterinarian who administered the vaccine. If any of these items are missing from the proof of rabies documentation, or if the veterinarian information listed is not the veterinarian who actually administered the vaccine, the dogs may be denied entry into the US. So now we'll briefly go over some common entry issues now that we've gone over the CDC's requirements. The most common entry, uh, the most common entry issues and reasons that dogs and cats are denied entry into the US that we've seen are missing or improper dog paperwork, inadequately vaccinated or underage dogs, and animals that arrive sick or dead. So I'll go over a couple, two examples here of rabies vaccination certificates. One of the main issues that CDC encounters at the ports of entry is missing or improper paperwork accompanying the dogs. If you recall, the rabies vaccination certificate must include four categories of information, the owner information, the dog information, the vaccine information and the veterinarian information. 
This slide shows two examples of rabies vaccination certificates that appear to be deficient or questionable. The first one on the left, you can see here, we have, well, first of all, this slide is filled, the, the certificate is filled out in Spanish and it's supposed to be in English, but fortunately I can read Spanish. So here we can see that we have the animal's information here. Down here where it says propietario should be the owner's information. And that's already, you can tell, is missing. We have the vaccine information here for the rabbits and rabies vaccine. Um, and then the veterinarian information, it looks like we only have a signature. So all of the other requirements of the name, license number, that's also missing. So on this slide, there's no owner information and not enough veterinarian information. Additionally, it appears to be altered as well with the dog's name, Jacinto. Jacinto is in darker ink. And it may be um, written on top of what looks like a photocopy of the original document. If the validity or content on the certificate is questionable, such as in this case, the dog may be denied entry upon arrival. Take a look at the certificate on the right. Again, we're looking for the owner information, which is listed up here. The dog information we have down here. The um, vaccine information is spelled out down here at the bottom. There's no sticker, but that's okay. It's not required. And then the veterinarian's information is down here at the bottom as well. This one we can see right off the bat that the owner's information, we have the name, which I've blacked out for privacy reasons, but the address is not filled in. So it's missing the address of the, of the owner. Additionally, we suspected that this certificate was not filled out by the veterinarian who actually administered the vaccine. We suspect that because the dog's paperwork was also accompanied by this vaccine card that had a rabies sticker here and it had a signature of a different person next to it along with a, a different stamp. So the stamp and the signature here didn't meet, didn't match. And um, whoever, whoever's name is next to the rabies vaccine sticker, we can be pretty sure that that's the person that actually gave the vaccine since they pulled that sticker off the vial after they gave it and stuck it onto this piece of paper. So since this, Certificate was not filled out by the same person, we can't accept this. And the vaccine card that they have doesn't have any information at all. It's just the sticker and the vet's name and license number. So both, in both of these cases, the dogs were denied entry and returned to the country of departure at the importer's expense. Well, let me go back. One more thing to note is that CDC does not actually require a specific format for the rabies vaccine certificate. The certificate may be presented as a vaccination booklet, a pet passport, or a sheet of paper, as long as it includes all of the required information. Another major issue that CDC frequently inquires is inadequately vaccinated dogs from high-risk countries. If you recall, the youngest a dog can be fully immunized against rabies is four months old. Four months of age is also the age that dog adult teeth start to come in. So the dog's teeth pattern should look similar to this English bulldog on the left. He has a couple puppy teeth and then a few adult teeth coming in as well. However, we often see dogs imported as young as one to two months of age with their baby teeth, just only starting only barely starting to come in, like this French bulldog in the center with hardly any baby teeth in. Six to eight week old French bulldogs like this lavender colored Frenchie on the right command high prices ranges, ranging from $3,000 to as much as $15,000 each in the US puppy market. The price drops precipitously as the dogs get older. So there is a high incentive for some importers in the puppy trade to try to evade federal regulations. These dogs often arrive in small batches of one to four dogs hand carried by a quote unquote flight parent who is hired to fly with the dogs but doesn't actually know the history of the animals. 
They also arrive in large batches of 20 or more dogs in dog crates on pallets on cargo flights. They often arrive with falsified rabies vaccination certificates stating that they are four months old when in reality, they're maybe only one to two months old. You can read more about these illegal puppy importations at the link on the slide here at the bottom if you're interested. So here's a case that I'll briefly go over. In this case, two French Bulldogs from Colombia arrived at a US airport late at night. They were accompanied by a rabies vaccination certificate that said that they were eight months old and that their colors were blue pied and chocolate. So like a darker gray and brown. You can see that the dogs did not match the description in the documentation as they are both white. And the CDC veterinarian estimated that the true ages of the dogs were six to eight weeks. These puppies were denied entry and returned to Colombia at the expense of the importer. Unfortunately, we do see some animals arriving either sick or dead, um, and it's usually not expected. And it can be a very tough and difficult and sad situation, but we need to make sure that the animals do not pose a risk to the health of humans um, and to the general public, as well as to other animals in the United States. So in this case, two poodle puppies who were approximately six to eight weeks of age. They arrived together in one crate on a cargo flight from South Korea. And sadly, one of the puppies was dead on arrival. South Korea is free of dog rabies and it's not considered high risk. So CDC does not actually require proof of rabies or have any age restrictions for the dogs. However, we do require that dogs and cats from all countries be healthy upon arrival. Since this one arrived dead and the other dog was exposed to it, I ordered a necropsy be done on this dog to ensure that the dog did not die from a zoonotic disease of public health concern. The CDC required that the live dog be placed on hold as well pending final disposition due to the exposure to the dead dog. The airline transferred the dogs to a local veterinarian who performed the exam on the live dog on the right and performed the necropsy on the dead dog on the left. And the veter veterinarian provided these photos as part of his report to CDC. Oftentimes CDC will also order a rabies test to be performed on dogs and cats that arrived dead. However, in consultation with the state public health veterinarian, we deemed it unnecessary in this case due to the cause of death that was determined during the necropsy, as well as due to the dog's travel history since South Korea is free of dog rabies. The cause of death was diagnosed as aspiration and asphyxiation. The veterinarian found partially digested food in the puppy's windpipe and that made it so he couldn't breathe. Since the dog did not die of a communicable disease, the live dog was ultimately released for entry. Here's another example. These two dogs arrived on a cargo flight from Ukraine, which is a high-risk country for rabies. The inspecting CBP officer alerted CDC that the dogs had excessive mucus in their eyes. CDC required that the dogs be transferred to a local veterinarian for evaluation because the dogs were not healthy upon arrival. One of the dogs was diagnosed with pneumonia in the lungs and was started on antibiotics. Veterinary evaluation fortunately determined that the dogs were not infected with a zoonotic disease that could spread to people. So both dogs were eventually released for entry. The dogs also had valid rabies vaccination certificates which made them eligible for entry. Dogs and cats are required to be healthy upon arrival. In rare, very rare circumstances, an importer may be granted a CDC permit to transport a sick dog or cat to the US for treatment. Permits must be issued to the importer prior to arrival. If a sick animal does not have a CDC permit and arrives in the US, CDC will place a, the animal on a medical hold 
and require veterinary care and evaluation upon arrival at the expense of the importer. So if you have any intentions of bringing in an ill or injured dog, make sure you contact CDC Animal Imports at cdc.gov in advance to make sure to see if uh, you'll be violating CDC's regulations um, or to see if you're eligible for a, a CDC import permit to bring in a sick animal. Now we'll briefly go over a few diseases of concern when importing dogs from foreign countries. The disease risk in imported pets may be higher than the risk in, in animals from this country. In Asia and Africa, street cats and dogs and meat market dogs are frequently rescued by organizations and brought to the United States. Most of these animals have never seen a veterinarian before or been vet, vaccinated against harmful diseases before being rescued. They are often fearful of humans, making them more likely to bite during transport. They often have intermingled with an unknown number of animals and commonly carry parasites and diseases that are not visible to the naked eye and may not be common or present in the United States. These animals can be exposed to many diseases, some of which we'll discuss today. So the biggest one that CDC is concerned about is of course rabies, as we previously mentioned. Rabies, one of the world's deadliest diseases, is nearly 100% fatal in people and animals once symptoms appear. Dog rabies accounts for 99% of human deaths caused by rabies globally. After a decades long elimination campaign in the United States, the US was declared free of dog rabies in 2007. However, dog rabies is still enzootic or endemic in over 100 countries around the world. And the risk of importing the variant back to the United States is ever present. Dogs can harbor the virus for three to six months or longer before showing any symptoms. So dogs may appear healthy when they arrive in the United States when they're being imported and then break with the disease after arrival. The rabies virus is spread through saliva from the bite or scratch of an infected animal. Rabies is preventable, fortunately, with vaccination, which is why CDC requires proof of rabies vaccination in dogs arriving from high-risk countries. People who are exposed to the bite or saliva of a rabid animal must receive post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP, before symptoms appear, which can appear within a few days to a few months after exposure. Since the incubation period is so variable, it is critical that people who are exposed to a rabid dog bite receive PEP as soon as possible. Otherwise, if you wait until the, human, the person develops symptoms, they most likely will end up dying, almost always. The photo here in this picture on this slide is of a rabid dog that was imported into the United States from Iraq in 2008. The dog became ill and died a few days after arrival, and 13 people had to receive PEP as a result of, ex of exposure to this dog. In addition to rabies, imported dogs and cats can also transmit other diseases of concern to people and to animals as well, such as brucellosis, leishmaniasis, leptospirosis, campylobacter, canine influenza, and internal and external parasites, among many other diseases. The picture on the left shows one of the parasites of concern, New World screwworm which is a type of flesh-eating maggot that affects both people and animals in many countries around the world. While we won't cover the details of all these diseases in this presentation, it is important to be on the lookout for a wide variety of health risks associated with importing dogs and cats from abroad. These diseases can spread rapidly in animal facilities, compromising the health of both animals and people. Pictured here on the right, a dog with leishmaniasis is a dog with leishmaniasis. 
Leishmaniasis is a protozoal infection that is transmitted by sand flies on the hair of animals in the crates and on bedding. Leishmaniasis presents as hair loss and weight loss in dogs. And in people, it can leave disfiguring scars or cause organ failure. The crate, bedding, dishes, and toys that accompany imported dogs and cats can also serve as fomites for foreign livestock diseases, for foreign diseases of livestock animals, such as foot and mouth disease and African swine fever. And these diseases we don't have in the US, and if they become imported here, it will um, cause major devastation to our livestock um, animal industry. Now we'll briefly go over a, a couple of steps um, that you can do to protect your staff and your facility when you're importing pets from abroad. Consider local disease risks when selecting where to rescue and import pets. Can you, can you avoid importing pets from a high-risk country for rabies? If you cannot, be sure to take extra precautions to avoid to avoid reintroduction of this deadly disease into our population. Fully vet and quarantine the animals in the country of origin before importation. Three to six months quarantine in the foreign country is recommended for dogs and cats being imported from rabies high-risk countries. It's, of course, it's recommended, but not required. With the dogs and cats under your care and observation in the foreign country for several months after rabies vaccination, you can have a high degree of confidence that the animals are not harboring rabies, the rabies virus. Upon arrival, dispose of or sanitize crates and bedding to prevent the importation of pests, leishmaniasis, and foreign livestock diseases. Separate imported animals from other animals in the facility for a duration of time based on disease risks in the country of origin. Consult a veterinarian to tailor a quarantine policy for your facility, which will vary based on where you're getting these animals from and the risks that um, the animals have. As a staff member of an animal facility, Avoid contact with animals during transport, especially ones that appear sick and have hair loss, vomiting, or diarrhea in the kennel or are showing other signs of disease. Report ill animals to your supervisor immediately. Practice good hand hygiene, wash, hand, wash your hands after using the bathroom, before eating and at the end of your shift. Use appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE depending on the disease risks of the animals in your facility. Examples include gloves, face shield, or eye protection, mask or respirator, coveralls, boots, and gowns. Know how to don and dock PPE safely and which PPE is appropriate for your facility. <clears throat> Follow your company's reporting procedures if a bite or scratch or exposure occurs. Routine diagnostic labs often do not have the tools to detect foreign animal diseases. So work with the state veterinarian to get a proper diagnosis of sick animals that arrived from foreign countries. Contact your state veterinarian whenever you import a sick animal. The state veterinarians for Kansas are Dr. Paul Gras Didier for Northeastern Kansas and Dr. John Nelson for South Central Kansas. Their contact information is on the next slide. And so I have a few resources here that you can access. This um, PowerPoint presentation I've been told will be made available to you. So you'll be able to access these slides after the presentation today. Um, so we have information on CDC import requirements, as well as CDC recommendations for traveling with pets. We have the list of the high-risk countries for dog rabies, information about how to keep animals and people healthy and safe when they're interacting together at the CDC Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. I've also shared a link 
for USDA importation requirements, which like I said, if you're going to be rescuing animals, bringing in animals for sale or for adoption, um, you'll have to get a USDA permit as well. And so you'll wanna look in here um, for the additional requirements for that. And then uh, if you would like more information about personal protective information, you can go to the OSHA Department of Labor website. And lastly, we have the contact information for your state veterinarian. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. And thank you so much for your attention. Here we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, that was great, Dr. Williams. Uh, we've had some questions come in. Uh, one of them, I want to reflect back on uh, your comments and, and the example that you showed on your paperwork. You had one in Spanish and part of it was also in English. Do all documents have to be in English or transcribed into English to be accepted when importing an animal into the United States? So the policy is that documents should be in English or accompanied by a certified English translation. And so like a certified English translation has a translation that's accompanied by a letter um, by a licensed translator who is certified to translate legal documents. And it includes their seal or stamp and their license number and it's signed and it verifies that the information was accurately translated. So you can't just have anybody translate the document for you if it's not in English, it has to be a certified translation. And you can find certified translators online. Um, there's a lot of uh, company, different companies that provide those services throughout the world. Um, now, sometimes we'll make an exception if it's in a language that, if it's in, um, like this example was both in English and in Spanish. Let me get to it here. So like here, it says mail. So I can read that and the color is cream and the, the breed is French Bulldog. So it's filled out in English, but uh, some, some of these other things like propietario, the nombre de la mascota, it's not in English. So um, if it gets to the point where we really can't figure out what's going on or you know, we can't understand what the certificate says, then more likely than not, the um, animal will be denied entry because the policy is it should be in English. Great, we have a few questions that have come in. Uh, one of them states, you know, at five to $15,000 per puppy or even a higher price for adult dogs. You know, what is done to prevent private jets, yachts, et cetera, from bringing them in and easily avoiding US customs and other checkpoints? Well, so our, our requirements apply at all ports of entry. So not just the flights, but um, there are over 300 ports of entry throughout the United States. And even when CDC isn't there, like CDC is at 20 of the ports of entry, but CBP is at all of the ports of entry. And so um, whether the animal is coming in by boat or a private jet um, or just you know walking across the border, they're supposed to be going through legal ports of entry and reporting, um, declaring to customs, border, border uh, CBP customs and border control, what items they're uh, importing. And so dogs are considered, un um, under the law, they're considered like goods and they have to be declared as goods that are being imported. And so the CBP officers will do the inspections on all the animals coming through. Okay. Great, we had another one come in. Um, do you know if any states have imposed strict import regulations from high risk countries or if any prohibit the importation of dogs from specified countries? Again, if any states have imposed strict import regulations from high risk countries or prohibit the importation of dogs from specified countries. Yes, so the states, all of the states will have varying requirements and 
those requirements are in addition to the CDC entry requirements. So at the border, CDC <laughs> will regulate um, what CDC's requirements are, and CBP will look into what USDA's requirements are and enforce those as well. Um, but you need to make sure that you are following your state's requirements, the, the final destination state requirements also, because um, the states will have varying ways for how they enforce that. For example, Hawaii has very ex you know, extremely strict rules and regulations. They don't have rabies in Hawaii, so they're extra strict and they require quarantine um, and a lot more uh, extensive um, entry requirements than what CDC does. So before you bring in an animal um, to the United States, check with your final destination country what those requirements are as well. So you're not surprised when the dog enters the state. As a follow up to that, are there countries that we cannot accept dogs and cats from today due to disease? CDC currently um, only has the suspension against dogs coming from Egypt, and they can only very rarely come in with a permit. And those permits, a CDC permit, are, are limited. Like we limit who we will allow those permits to be issued to and for what types of dogs. So the vast majority of dogs are, from Egypt are not allowed at all to enter the United States. Um, the important thing to note, though, is that um, the airlines are allowed to make their own rules, as well as ships or um, other commercial transporting transporters, they can make their own rules. If they want to put in a ban for certain types of animals from certain countries, they can do that. And the federal government doesn't really interfere with the rules that each private company makes. So if you're trying to, let's say you want to import an, an animal from I don't know, Colombia or some country and, and one airline says they're not going to fly, they don't fly dogs from that country, then you would have to shop around to find a different airline because CDC does not ban any animals from a specific country except for the uh, temporary suspension that's currently going on with dogs from Egypt. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So with all of that said, with lots of moving um, pieces and parts with that, you know, has there been any push to have more strict rules and requirements for animals imported into the United States than what is already being imposed? Um, so the, the rules and regulations have changed over the years and um, they've gotten more strict over the years. I know that there is an act going through Congress called, I think they call it the Healthy Dog Act, where um, they're trying to in, like create some stricter guidelines about what it means for an animal to be healthy and all the different requirements that are necessary to verify the animal, like different paperwork and testing that's required before those animals can come in. Um, so there is discussion like that going, working its way through Congress. I'm not sure if it'll be passed and turned into a law or not, but um, yeah, things are always moving and changing. So try to keep up with the websites and even if you're familiar and you've imported animals many times in the past, should periodically check to make sure that um, nothing has changed so that you don't get surprised on your next shipment. You are correct. Nobody likes surprises, that's for sure. <laughs> so um, reminder to the participants, if you have a question for Dr. Williams, go ahead and put that in the Q&A function that's available at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll get that asked. Um, and Dr. Williams, you, you mentioned the age of the pets that came in, you know, especially dogs at a minimum of uh, that 16 weeks with it. And um, if they need to, they'll be returned back to that country uh, with it. So with that little bit of background that you uh, provided earlier, for those importers that have had a shipment denied, will their future shipments be scrutinized more or could they be prohibited from making future imports? So typically if an, an animal is denied entry, um, that animal will be able to come back into the country once they meet the requirements. So that specific animal is not banned from ever coming back. They can, once they meet the requirements, they can come back. Um, if we've noticed 
that an importer has had repeated problems, there is a way for um, CBP to put that on to put that that importer on an intensified screening list. So they might maybe all of their shipments in the future um, will be checked, but uh, that doesn't always happen. That's usually for like repeat offenders, people who are repeatedly bringing in underage dogs and we've explained the rules and they just are doing it over and over again. So um, maybe that answers your question. It does. I, I'm, you know, we're really glad there are so many checks and balances along the way, but the opportunity for that animal to come back when they're the uh, right age, et cetera. So, so that's always good to hear. Mm -hmm. I want to shift gears for just a moment here um, about a service dog. So if someone would like to bring a service dog in from another country, do they follow the same rules and regulations to import that animal when entering into the United States, or are there any exemptions for a service animal? That is a great question. Um, so our CDC entry requirements actually are fairly mild, like the dog basically just needs a rabies vaccine certificate and the animal has to be healthy. So, um, and you know, with a cat, we don't require any paperwork. So it's just the animal has to be healthy. But so for service dogs, the same rules apply. The same rules apply. Um, so if you're traveling with your service animal, make sure you have your up-to-date rabies vaccination certificate with them or with you at the time of travel. And um, yeah, so, you know, if the vaccine certificate is maybe missing some information, we might try to work with you. But for the most part, um, the dog will have to be sent back because we don't want people getting exposed to this rabies virus and potentially dying. Um, like I said, almost like 99.9% .9 of people exposed to rabies will die if they don't um, get that post-exposure prophylaxis in time. And so we take this very seriously and even service animals have to meet this vaccination requirement. It definitely is something that needs to be taken seriously. And, and that's great to know with, that that's followed through throughout with that. Um, in Kansas, we have three military bases. And we know a lot of our military personnel have domestic animals that follow them uh, when they may be transferred along the, along the, along the way, um, transferring from state to state or uh, across um, to another country. Now, what type of rules and regulations, if any, that are different um, for our military personnel with their animals as they're traveling? So the military personnel have to follow all the same rules as everybody else. Um, like I said, there's a, the suspension of dog importations from Egypt, and uh, with the exception of those rare permits that CDC has the authority to issue, uh, we limit who is eligible for those permits, and so military personnel are one of the few groups that are eligible for those permits if they need to bring in a dog from Egypt, so that would kind of be like an exception. Well, that's great to hear. Um, again, uh, we still have participants on. Uh, we had one come on, but I'm gonna ask a question here where I read that question that just came sure. in. Um, do you have any tips um, to provide that can help someone avoid like internet adoption scams What that may uh, have imported pets with them? Do you have any tips on that? Oh, that's great because we see that all the time. And on, um, where is this? Yeah. So if you go to this link at the bottom here, we also have a link on um, connected to this talking about um, a, internet adoption scams for all animals. It's, it seems to be increasing, especially during the pandemic. Like we have a lower supply of dogs in the US, dogs and cats, um, a lot of the um, adoption, the sh animal shelters have been emptying out while people were quarantined at home or uh, working from home more often. And so it seems like uh, these adoption scams are increasing and internet sales scams. So what we typically recommend, um, a few tips, is to try to buy local, uh, see if you can go actually see where the animal is coming from before you buy them. 
We've heard of situations where um, dogs from abroad, uh, they'll be born, they'll be bred and born in, uh, in um, what, oh, my mind is, is blanking, but what's that word? It's for when you're breeding, you're like those people who breed in really confined spaces, breed dogs in puppy mills. Sorry about that. <laughs> brain fart right there. So uh, there'll be animals that are bred in puppy mills and then people will take them to um, like a, a dog um, slaughter facility and put them like in, like take photos in front of a slaughter facility and make it seem like you're rescuing them from the meat market when really they were just bred in, in the puppy mill. And then you'll be charged a few thousand dollars to ship them to the US. Um, so there'll be scams like that or there'll be scams where people um, will request the money first and send you a bunch of pictures of all these different animals and then the animal never shows up or it shows up under age, not the age that they told you it was and gets denied entry at the border. Or a lot of times they'll show up sick and even die shortly after arrival. And so that's why we really stress the importance of trying to look at the animal first in person, see where they're actually being housed and bred, um, if you can go there. And if you have to um, purchase a dog online, try to meet the dog and get the dog first before you make a payment. That just sounds like really great basic common sense. And basic common sense, yes. Um, and you can't always trust the websites either because we've seen um, a lot of falsified websites as well. So it's Good. a tough situation. Um, one more question before we shift gears on another question outside of today's topic, but um, other than the animal uh, that are confiscated, um, are there other repercussions to importers that bring animals in illegally? So CDC is not an enforcement branch of the government. We don't have the authority to fine anybody or to um, arrest anyone or anything like that. Uh, we have on occasion worked with other agencies that can provide some enforcement, um, but I would say that's not as common. So like CBP has, has the authority to um, force the importer to be returned, or like to, to not come into the country and they can force them to go back to the country that they came from accompanying the dog, that doesn't always happen, but that is possible an, an option that CBP can pursue for repeated violators. Great, um, we have one quite more question that's come in through the question and answer function that our participants are using along with great comments on the information that you've provided. So thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, so a question has come in and it may be outside of the scope of, of what you do uh, and where we're at today, but we can sure follow up. Um, but what is being done to keep other problem animals like invasive animals that damage our native ecosystem, ecosystems to keep them out of the United States? You know, all veterinarians would agree that keeping out dog rabies is very, very important but it seems we're losing the war maybe on invasive species that keep coming in um, with the latest cases and involving some, some birds that were brought in. So, so what can you um, tell us or advise our uh, participants today on where we could get some additional information? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I agree with you that uh, diseases that don't just affect people, but also affect our ecosystem ecosystems as well as invasive species of animals are very, very important to our country, protecting uh, all the different populations within our country, both people and animal alike and wildlife as well. And like I said earlier, you can see on this slide, animal importations are regulated by a number of different agencies. And so if we're looking at invasive um, different wildlife species, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has a presence at the uh, ports of entry. And um, they have fairly strict requirements and they've been known to confiscate and deny entry to animals that aren't supposed to be coming in 
per the regulations, they have important export certificate requirements as well. So you'll wanna look on their websites. And then the USDA is really um, looking into agricultural health and livestock health. So they have requirements about bringing in different pests and ticks and um, all different kinds of diseases that can affect our wildlife. And so they have a presence also um, and they have requirements. So, you know, it's our, the way that we regulate it is a little scattered, but it's based on what our, um, our missions are as, as laid down by the, the laws and acts written by Congress. And so USDA's mission is to protect livestock and agricultural health and animal welfare. And so they're looking into that as well. And um, you may need to talk to them more since CDC, we really focus on the people diseases. Um, but from my experience of coordinating and working with both the agencies, when, when we see, when I see a dog, so for example, I, um, I work at CDC headquarters in Atlanta, but I provide on-call services for all of um, the CDC quarantine stations that are at all the different ports of entry throughout the U.S. And so when um, the inspecting officers at the ports of entry identify a problem related to animals, they'll call me and um, I'll, you know, either look at videos and pictures and stuff to help them determine what's going on and whether to de uh, deny or allow entry. And so if we see animals that I'm aware um, or pests or, or invasive species that I'm aware shouldn't be coming in per the other agency's regulations, then we will refer the CBP officers who are the ones really checking everything at the ports to communicate with the other agencies. And so we kind of all work together to try to keep everybody safe. Well, great. Uh, I have one last question from the Q&A and then I'll turn it over to Chris for him to wrap it up for us. Everything's been great. Thank you very much for answering some really good questions that were submitted along the way. And uh, one of the participants wants to know if there are any concerns with variants of COVID being more of a threat to pests. Hot topic right now. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. So, as um, so, CDC and many other agencies are still currently monitoring and doing research to better understand how SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 in people, how that virus affects pets like dogs and cats. And while we have seen some very rare cases that indicate that dogs and cats can get the virus. Um, we haven't seen much or hardly at all any illness in the animals. And we don't have any evidence at this time that the animals can spread it back to people and uh, that the dogs and cats can spread it back to people. And so right now we consider the risk of dogs and cats getting COVID and spreading it back to people to be extremely low and unlikely. Um, the variants are always changing. And so we're keeping an eye on the situation. We haven't had any information to indicate that um, dogs and cats pose any greater risk at this time. Great, we've come up on our hour. Thank you for your time. With that, Chris, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Thank you for presenting for us today, Dr. Williams. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Participants that join today. Um, next webinar series is going to be Thursday, June 10th at 12 p.m. with Andrew Campbell on animal cruelty, and he is an animal cruelty abuse law enforcement officer. Thank you.